Welcome to the Civil 20 TST Working Group of G20, where we are dedicated to promoting access to and use of technology, enhanced security, and improved transparency for advanced societal well-being. This year, we are proud to announce that Amma, Shri Mata Amritanandamai Devi, is the chair of C20 India 2023, and we are excited to work under her leadership. In today's world, due to the advancement of technology, countries and communities are interconnected more than ever. Because of the increasing role technology has in our lives, it is crucial that we understand its impact on our societies. Our working group will explore the wide-ranging roles and influence of civil society organizations in promoting effective policymaking that leverages technology and strengthens security and transparency for the betterment of the world. We will focus on access and affordability of innovative technologies for social impact, with a special emphasis on vulnerable communities such as children, women, and the disabled. We aim to facilitate transparency through platforms for advocacy, comprehensive assessments, and implementation of regulatory measures. We will explore responsible use of the internet and media to ensure security and harmony for all. Our team will also explore the importance of integrating a compassion-driven outlook on technology-enabled innovation strategies. We are committed to addressing these issues by supporting long-term holistic solutions for building societies that are technology-empowered, secure, and held accountable by their transparency to their citizens. The insights from civil society organizations are vital for building technologies that enable automated decision-making and knowledge by supporting societal development based on equity and inclusivity. Join us in our efforts to promote access to technology, to enhance security, and to improve transparency for advancing the well-being of society. You are invited to participate in our webinars and policy workshops and share successful project examples with us. Together, we can make a positive impact on the world. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning to some of you. A very warm welcome to this C20 policy dialogue on security, safety, and resilience. We are extremely grateful to all of you to, in terms of participating in this evening's dialogue. Uh, we really will start with a short prayer as is the custom in India to start an important function with a short prayer. This is mine and that is his, say the small-minded. The wise believe that the entire world is a family. Maha Upanishad, Chapter 6, Verse 72. I am Nijak Parul, Viti Kainena. Cheap as Udar Charitan Ant Vasudeva Kutumbakam. Thank you very much, Amrita. Um, now let us start with a short presentation. Uh, let me just share my screen. So, dear participants, colleagues, welcome to the Civil 20 Technology Security Transparency Workshop Policy Discussion Meeting. So, we're going to be discussing here topics related to cybersecurity, safety, internet governance, digital rights, and so on. 
Uh, as you all already know, Civil 20 is an official engagement group of G20. We are so honored to have all of you here. We deeply appreciate the time you've taken to certainly be here amongst your busy schedule for the next couple of hours. So I wanted to start with a short introduction. Uh, the G20 members um, really represent a large part of the world. So they really represent about 85% of the global GDP, over 75% of the global trade, and about two thirds of the world population. Amongst all the engagement groups, Civil 20 is one of the most prominent and oldest engagement groups that started out very early on along with the G20 collaborations. So we all know being part of civil societies that sometimes we may feel what is the real difference we are really making to the world. And this year's uh, theme for Civil 20 reflects the extreme optimism and strength that the Civil 20 groups can actually do together. So the meaning of this, uh, the, the logo of Civil 20 really stands for you are the light. It really symbolizes the flame of hope self-motivation and selfless service. And it is a reminder to ourselves that even though we may not directly experience the desired results of our efforts, our life is shining and is having a positive impact on the world. A little bit about our organization. Uh, we are extremely honored to really hold the chair for Civil 20. And the chair is Honorable Humanitarian and Chancellor of Amrita Vishwavidya Pitam, Sri Mata Amritananda Mai Devi. The university she heads has a threefold mission. And uh, the mission it really stands for education for life and living, compassion driven research, and global impact. In terms of what the university has been able to accomplish, in its 20 years since its, its inception, it has scaled to become the 41st best university in the world or in the top 50 when it comes to the impact it has been able to create as per the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings Forum uh, on, based on the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So eighth best from good health and well-being, gender equality, 15th best when it comes to clean water and sanitation, and 32nd when it comes to quality education. Within India, that has over 1,000 plus universities, we are the fifth best. In terms of the structure itself of the Civil 20, we have the chair, Srimata Amritananda Mai Devi, the chancellor of Amrita University and the worldwide humanitarian. And she is the principal and, the, and under her is a principal coordinator, ambassador, Sri Vijay Nambiar, who's the main point of contact for all the external stakeholders and the C20 working groups. There is also a secretariat, an international advisory committee. And totally we have 14 working groups on various different thematic verticals and for more information, you can also visit civil20.net. Now, what are we here to discuss? Our group is really hoping to look at a holistic approach to really developing a set of policy recommendation. We are aiming to collect input from all the relevant civil society organizations from all over the world. And I'll show you in just a minute as to how well we have been able to connect to the world. And we've been extremely delighted with the positive response we've received from pretty much, you could say, three fourths of the world so far. And we believe this policy that we really recommend should really be evidence-based and we really look forward to have your recommendations and share your experience uh, towards this policy making. Like I mentioned, this is actually the global map of all the countries that we have really reached out to. It has been a very significant effort from the team in India and abroad. We are a collective international team that has been able to accomplish this and we are very, very, very happy with the overwhelming response. So what are we really looking forward from this meeting? The output of this engagement group is a policy path of recommendations to G20 countries and specifically 
what will go from this meeting is formulation of a zero draft policy, which will be deliberated a few times before it gets recommended to the G20 countries. Now, I just wanted to set the uh, agenda here for our discussion uh, to say that what we are seeing is really changing vocabularies, right? We used to get softwares to really protect our systems, but today we are looking at investing into cyber insurance. We were talking about exploitations uh, as a real cause for you know, the presence of cybersecurity, but today the norm is triple exploitations. For example, when it comes to ransomware, where people are not only threatened uh, for a ransom themselves, but their organizations, their customers, et cetera. Uh, what seemed like vul vulnerabilities are now today geopolitical threats to nations. And we always talk about landscapes when it comes to risks or threats, but now it has really transformed into uh, deep founded repercussions in deep and dark webs. What used to be disguise or decoy is now converted into dynamic uh, deception, you could say, where you're looking at a mix of offense and defensive mechanisms under the umbrella of maximum protection. And finally, what we thought is just cyber attacks that used to be a common vocabulary we use is today changing into cyber pandemics. Now, what I'd like us to think about is while this has been the case, not all has been this bad. Countries, governments, many uh, associations have taken significant strides to really get to policies and several important milestones. For example, the establishment of a cybersecurity index, for example, ranking countries has given very much exposure to a civil a civilian on their own nation's posture when it comes to cybersecurity. So things like this have done excellent uh, in terms of providing visibility. But if you're truly in this generation of say generation five attacks or on the verge of cyber, uh, cyber pandemic, what is it that we can do to really think about creating a potentially a manageable situation or even drive towards a reliable defensive, say, vaccine? So how can we really strengthen our infrastructure, whether it is internet or any of the other critical infrastructures, and, and do coordinated action between international institutions, governments, enterprises, civil society, and individuals themselves? So that is really the, uh, you could say, setting of a uh, uh, tone for our today's discussion. And uh, the format will really be that I will really call out to uh, many of you that are attending today. And we'd like you to cover some of these as part of your uh, talk today. Um, and as a moderator, I will do my best in keeping us all on time and on topic. Um, and we ultimately would like suggestions for measurable and actionable policy. So if we can do that, that would be great. As a first speaker, may I kindly request Anne-Marie Buzatu, who is here from ICT4 Peace Foundation to kindly share her thoughts with us. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Anne-Marie Buzatu, and I'm the executive director of ICT4 Foundation, a Geneva, Switzerland-based think and do tank, which for almost 20 years has been working at the intersection of peace, security, protection of human rights, and ICTs. We carry out research, policy advice, and are a recognized early mover in identifying ICT challenges and risks before most other organizations do. And in 2020, we launched the ICT for Peace Academy, which provides custom designed capacity building courses on topics such as cyber diplomacy, impacts of mis and disinformation on humanitarian missions, application of international law to cyberspace, and gender and ICTs, which I especially want to highlight today on International Women's Day. Our work takes place in all areas across the world where we partner with governments, civil society organizations, and other stakeholders to develop and implement ICT-based solutions for conflict prevention and resolution. We are a neutral civil society organization which promotes a safe, secure, and open cyberspace. 
I'm honored to be able to speak to you here today at the G20 Policy Dialogue on Security, Safety, and Resilience, and this session on technology, security, and transparency. And I thank you very much for this invitation. At today's meeting, I would like to highlight some key issues that we believe require urgent attention at the global level. These include the need for greater international cooperation on cybersecurity, including in, through innovative multi-stakeholder engagement. Cyber threats are a growing concern for governments, businesses, and individuals alike worldwide. At the same time, cyberspace is inherently a public-private landscape with private actors exercising the most direct control on large parts of its physical and logical infrastructure. We need better policies that promote effective international public-private co cooperation, including with civil society organizations, and better information sharing to mitigate and effectively respond to these threats. Also, the next issue I'd like to raise is the importance of protecting human rights in the digital age. As more and more of our aspects of our lives move online, it is critical that we develop policies that ensure the protection of fundamental human rights, such as privacy and freedom of expression. But in order to do that, we first need to better understand how human rights are impacted online, how to translate existing international human rights standards to users, activities, and experiences online, and to define more clearly the roles and responsibilities of private controlled online platforms. As a corollary to the previous point, we'd like to draw your attention to the issue of data collection and surveillance. ICTs are collecting enormous amounts of very detailed and personal information about our daily interactions and activities with little oversight or restrictions. This is an area in which we need more robust international standards and oversight in order to better keep our private lives private. Then the growing threats posed by cybercrime. Unfortunately, and as you mentioned in the introduction, Cybercrime has become almost routine with increasing numbers of cyber criminal incidents ranging from online scams all the way to sophisticated large scale operations happening every day. Furthermore, our criminal systems have not been adequately adapted to respond to crimes that may be perpetrated by an actor, for example, located in one jurisdiction, using infrastructure uh, located in other jurisdictions and having more still more impacts in more jurisdictions. This creates often a situation of de facto impunity for the vast majority of cyber crimes taking place today. Traditional investigative techniques and even a mutual legal assistance investigations are typically not fast enough to react to the speed that crimes are taking place in cyberspace and certainly not to prevent them. We need to rethink how we can better respond to cyber crimes as well as prevent them from happening in the future. And as a corollary to this point, the importance of protecting critical infrastructure and critical information infrastructure from cyber attacks. More and more of our critical infrastructure systems are governed by ICT control systems, which can manage the systems in very ineffective ways, but which also render them vulnerable to cyber attack. These systems are vital for our well being, for example, to provide clean water and energy. And so disrupting them can be catastrophic, resulting in serious damage, injury, and even death. For several years now, ICT for Peace has been calling on governments to publicly declare that they will not cyber attack critical infrastructure systems anywhere, a call that we are reiterating today. Next, I'd like to point to the potential of ICTs for prevention, for conflict prevention and resolution. ICTs can be powerful tools for promoting dialogue, reconciliation, and peace building in conflict affected communities and fragile communities. But we need more policies that support the development and implementation of ICT-based solutions for conflict prevention and resolution. There are numerous tools and techniques that have been and that are being developed by the humanitarian community and the CSO community. And many of these are low-tech but effective ways to facilitating discussions and build peace. Additional support, including funding for the development of these tools and techniques is needed so that organizations such as ICT for Peace can carry on this important work. And on a related note, the potential of ICTs to promote environmental peace building. ICTs can be employed to reduce the risk of conflicts stemming from climate change, such as crop failure and scarcity of water, and to help promote sustainable peace. For example, through the use of early warning systems, um, information capture systems, mm -hmm. and the roles of technologies in peace building itself. 
This year, ICT for Peace is launching a new pro um, program on the use of ICTs in environmental peace building, and we think this is an issue that's only going to grow in importance in the future. So to address these issues, we are proposing a set of measurable and actionable policy recommendations, including Number one, to develop international standards for cybersecurity that take into account the particular areas of expertise and effective control of both public and private actors, and that prioritize the protection of critical infrastructure and the prevention of cyber attacks. Two, investing in cybersecurity education and training pro programs to build capacity of both public and private actors, and that increase in awareness of cyber threats, including to human rights, and the best practices for mitigating these threats. Three, to promote the development and implementation of human rights-based policies that better articulate the individual rights to privacy, free speech, and access to information online, and deliver effective protection of these human rights. Four, we reiterate our call on governments to publicly declare that they will not cyber attack critical infrastructure systems. And five, supporting the use of ICTs for peace building and conflict resolution through initiatives such as funding for research and development of innovative solutions and promoting partnerships between governments, civil society organizations, and technology companies. This would certainly include dedicated programs to using ICTs to prevent or mitigate risks posed by climate change. In conclusion, we believe that the G20 has a critical role to play in addressing these key issues and promoting policies that can help mitigate these challenges. As you said before in the beginning, it's an organization that represents approximately 85% of the global GBT, GDP, and two thirds of the world's population. And so the G20 has the power, reach, and influence to address these challenges posed by, um, by ICTs, but also the solutions that they can provide as well as implement effective responses. We thank you for the opportunity to speak at this event of it, uh, today, and we hope to work in hand in hand with you to respond to these important ICT challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anne-Marie Rosato. That was just wonderful. I mean, it just reflects the amount of work you've done, uh, you know, uh, in this area. We have seen the types of recommendations and the pieces of research that you have done definitely very, very extensive and very, very deep and also uh, showcasing kind of the emerging actors in this whole play of cybersecurity, right? Like the private actors, it's, yeah. uh, I mean, even I have even heard that it, it's almost impossible to really now enforce law especially say with regard to privacy, because these large players have so, so many resources to be able to implement some of these laws that we are re really requiring from a privacy point of view, from a competition law point of view, it might even yes. kick some people out. So how do you really think this multi-stakeholder can really go towards secure, private, <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, looking at solutions that can really bring both of these you could say disparate conversations together to help the civil society and people at large. So that I mean that's a big question, and I will try to respond to it. Um, first of all, I think it's it's incumbent on us, particularly the civil society to community, to try to come up with a vision of the, how we want our rights to be protected online. What what are the standards? What do we mean for privacy? What kind of information? Um, you know, how should it be secured? Should there, who owns the information, for example, that we share online on platforms? Are there restrictions in how they can sell in different platforms can sell it? Um, there's the whole new, this whole new uh, commodity even of data that's now at the basis of, of most of the business models of many companies. And yet it's our information. It's information that's based on our lives. So I think it's something that we really should have a much deeper dive in, and articulate how we want the information that we share and use online to be handled and to be secured and safeguarded. And then the second part of this, and this goes to the multi-stakeholder aspect, we have to figure out what actor can do what to do this. So I think it would be a collaborative effort. Um, there will be certainly a role for governments to play in regulation. There will be a role for companies to, to say, to if we, for example, articulate standards for how they acquire, store, secure information, um, and, and also then for us as users to, I, you know, how do we safely use the internet? What do we demand um, as, as users of these technologies? 
And it's it, it's really almost at the heart of democracy now, since these platforms are so important to the way that we are communicating with each other. So it's really breaking down in you know what how we want our information to be shared and treated and taken care of and you know who owns it make that more clear and then also to identify what role each actor each of us can play to making that vision a reality and so that's it's a it would be a, it's a big exercise but it's i think something that is really vital for us if we want to try to have you know the kind of safe and secure uh, human rights respecting internet that we've been talking about. I totally agree with you. Uh, you talked about even capacity building, et cetera. I mean, standards uh, before yeah. I touch on the But even the definitions, you know, in this space yeah. is, is, is not completely agreed upon. So the, maybe the first step is to just do that and then get everybody on the same board. And and especially now that the the volume of the presence online is really shifting in terms yes. of the number of users from the developing world really taking on the center stage, you could say maybe perhaps in the next decade or so. Uh, I don't know how participative they have been and you've been in this field, do you want to comment on that? Um, I, I, I First of all, I completely agree with you that we need to have better standards. Um, we use words very loosely. We use terms very loosely. And if I say cybersecurity, it may um, be something very different from what you mean by cybersecurity, or I may be using it in a different way because it can really go from really keeping your systems secure and safe from attacks or uh, to how we are secure online um, to the kind of security for us online and our human security. So um, I think having clear definitions so that when we use these terms, we mean the same things is, is an important starting point. And that's, I think that is the first step in such an exercise of trying to identify and articulate the vision of how we want these technologies to be used. You know, what is it, what do we mean by terms when we use them? And then how does how would that using those terms and having common agreements on the those same terms have you know contribute to having a more similar vision? In terms of the um, you know rapid numbers of people coming online, which is I, I think a very important you know we want we want it to be an inclusive space for and for to have more participation, but um, we have to think about how we can have those conversations uh, with the people coming online in what kinds of fora, how can we also reflect the different cultural aspects and value, values of different peoples that are coming online and how do we foster that global community? So um, I think that's really tricky, but it's something that we need to actually have a more deeper discussion about. Um, and I think civil society is really the place to start that because we are the ones that can represent the people that are coming online um, and 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 be that kind of voice and in, in those discussions. One more question, and I have this on the chat. As you were saying, we have to help prevent actors on attacking civil cyber infrastructure during a regular war. There's policies that condemn actors that they target civilians and civilian infrastructure. How do we ensure that happens in the cybersecurity, especially with the fact of anonymity? It's a very technical question. <laughs> Difficult. Um, well, <laughs> Look, it's a very, it's, I mean, it's one of the discussions that's going on right now. And this is more specifically about the application of international humanitarian law to cyber, to conflicts that are taking on place online. And also goes back to the question or the, the point that you made about definitions. We don't even have a clear definition for what a cyber attack would be under international law. Um, so we are starting to see some different types of, uh, unfortunately, we're seeing cyber attacks that are maybe part of physical attacks as well, um, a trend that's going on. So, you know, how do we define what is a cyber attack and when it would, um, when it would be an attack under a regular war? And that threshold has not been defined defined yet. So it's it's a question of, first of all, having a common agreement and clear vision on when a cyber attack would amount to an attack as we would consider that under war. Um, and then we can't ensure that this is happening at this point because we we are just not prepared and we haven't we haven't come up with the right kind of standards or translated our existing international legal frameworks to this um, to this 
this this way of waging conflict. Um, and the factor of anonymity is it just makes it much more uh, challenging uh, under international law. What you would say here is the attribution. Where would you inter? How? But who? To whom would you attribute the the attack? Is it a state? Um, if it's done by you know an anonymous actor, how can we? And and international law is only applying to governments. Um, with a few, like one exception in, under international humanitarian law. So how do we then, by what standards would we say that a, for example, a cyber attack, if we already had a definition for that, how would we then attribute it to an actor that is a subject under international law? And this, these things have not been um, fleshed out, unfortunately. So it's something, again, that we need to look at. The ICRC is looking at some of these questions, the International Committee for the Red Cross. Um, and they are the kind of the guardians of international humanitarian law or the law that applies in during armed conflict. Um, but it's something that is unfortunately not been well defined. And that means that there are practices going on that are almost certainly against the spirit of a law, but maybe not against the letter of the law. So it's a it's a big, <laughs> big topic. Yes. I agree. Yeah. Thank you so much, um, Anne-Marie Musatu. We will continue to talk to you uh, over this time period. Now, let me just go to our next speaker, uh, Idan Ring from the Israel Internet Association. We're so happy to have you. Hi, very Hi. happy to be here. Thank you for uh, um, letting me speak and uh, very thrilled to be a part of this uh, really great international group. I'm speaking on, on behalf of the Israeli Internet Association, uh, which is a chapter of the global uh, ISOC, the Internet Society, here in Israel. Um, I am vice, vice president principal of, of the Israeli Association and in charge of all community and uh, social affair. Um, I wanted to, to speak about some of the uh, projects we lead and execute here in Israel in the last two years regarding security and safety here. And um, maybe I can uh, um, give you some examples of the work uh, we do, which is very uh, different from things we heard before. We most of our work is public education and uh, assistance and support for for. Oh, you have my presentation. Thank you very much. And um, so, actually, we have three three main projects that uh, um, promote security and safety for Israeli internet users of all uh, different groups here in Israel. Uh, we, are, uh, uh, we, we are supported by, by the public. We're not a government institution. We are, we're an NGO. Um, and, and our goals are, are to, to our vision, we can say our goals to, uh, are to promote a, a safer, more open, more accessible, and, and more equal uh, uh, internet here in Israel for all for all users and all citizens. Uh, we use, we do this with uh, several uh, projects on the ground. Although we have uh, uh, we have also research and policy uh, activity, and 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 we we uh, uh, try to study the web and learn it, and we produce also policy papers. But a lot of our work is facing the people, facing the user. And our main uh, um, project in concerning security and safety issues is a hotline. It's, a, it's like an internet um, safety hotline, which uh, offers assistance and support for people who are affected or, or hurt by violence or attacks or cyber attacks on the web. Not only cyber issues, also safety issues uh, that have to do with bullying or violence or or, or these kinds, especially with minority groups, especially uh, groups like uh, ethnic minorities, like Arab minorities and Arab society in, in Israel, women, uh, uh, um, uh, senior citizens, and, and so on. And this, this hotline provides uh, human assistance, not only uh, 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 training or, or, or uh, uh, um, tools, but there is somebody on the line that, uh, uh, people can approach, can reach out, and if they need help or assistance with something that happened on the web, if they, ha they have been uh, attacked or 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 uh, somehow uh, uh, hurt by something on on the internet, 
we can provide some kind of assistance. Another thing we have is a, a cyber protection center for individuals and small businesses, we call Block, which gives mainly um, manuals and, and, and information because a lot of times we see that concerning cybersecurity, uh, knowledge is, is the first step, it's the, it's the first problem. People have very low uh, cyber literacy and digital literacy uh, rates, very low literacy. And, and if they knew how to protect themselves, they would mostly like 90% maybe of the attack can be avoided if they have if they know very simple steps. It's not very not it's not like they need something very uh um uh, uh technical to protect themselves okay so um our hotline if you can thank you so we have we have like four main activity channels concerning security when we when we work with our hotline um the first is a personal human assistant, somebody on the line that can really give support. Sometimes if you are being, uh, uh, if you're a victim of extortion or if you're a victim of some kind of other type of, of cyber crime, you need somebody to tell you to relax. You need somebody to tell you you're not alone. Okay, somebody that can tell you maybe not, not to be, uh, uh, you know, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, to think before you act. Okay, many people that are, are, are victims on the web, they feel alone, they don't know what to do, and it's very hard to manipulate. It's very easy, I mean, to manipulate them. When, when, they, when they talk to somebody that assists them, first of all, he, he, he helps them relax, he helps them think. And, and if, we're, if we're talking about like um, malware, if you're talking about somebody who, who's trying to... Uh, um, to, to make you pay money, okay? So many people, the first thing they do is, okay, I'll pay because I want this to stop. But our, our uh, help center, they somebody sometimes they tell them, okay, maybe first of all, you should think, and maybe it's not a good idea to, to, uh, 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 to pay somebody that threatens you because maybe what he says online is not true. And mostly we know that things that uh, a threat that being sent online mostly are not uh, are not really true. So the first thing is that we help people personally, human human support, personal support. This, the second thing that is very important, I think, to discuss here is to communicate with social media platforms. Because from our data, we receive more than 3,000 uh, requests for, 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 for assistance every year. And more than 50% are, are, are of the security and safety issues and incidents are on social media platforms, on meta platforms, Instagram, Facebook, on TikTok, and other platforms. And and people are are supposed to to be, be able to report these incidents and, and receive assistance on on apps in the platform. But usually this doesn't happen. They do not receive any any response, so they come to us. And we are with most platforms. We are considered. Uh, um, a trusted flagger. We are official partners of most of the platforms. So when something happens, which uh, 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 um, um, uh, needs very uh, fast response, we can report it as a as a trusted partner. We report it to the platform, and they are supposed to give assistance uh, quickly, and 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 they they answer us um, faster than they answer the common user. But still, sometimes we see they don't really uh, uh, also give us any answers. Or if it's a, a security issue, if somebody has been, his, his uh, uh, page has been hijacked or something like that, if it's a security issue and not a real life threatening safety issue, then the platform won't give also any, any uh, assistance or any support. So, some of the problems is communicating with the platforms that it's very hard to make them uh, uh, assist victims. Uh, the third thing is research, map, analyze new threats, new, new trends, because the problem is cybersecurity threats are very, very dynamic. They are very, uh, uh, um, they change all the time. And this is also something that is very important as a global issue because we can learn from one each other and 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 share knowledge, and the and the fourth thing I talked about before is educate the public, give the public tools and awareness, 
and, and advice and knowledge that can help him prevent the crime. Because it's much easier and more important to prevent the crime than to deal with the victim and the crime after he's being uh, attacked. Because most cyber crimes, very, it's very hard to assist the person after he was attacked. Um, and the last thing we deal with is, is, is in the issue of digital rights and digital inequalities. We have uh, many issues of, of uh, uh, digital gaps and inequalities here in Israel. We focus on three uh, uh, um, uh, minority underprivileged groups. One is uh, uh, Arab citizens, the Arab society in Israel, which is 20% of the population. And they have very uh, 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 specific problems uh, with, with digital uh, barriers and digital gaps, digital literacy, also because of the, of the language barrier, because uh, they have a lower level of Hebrew, which is the first official language in Israel, and most digital services are in Hebrew. The second, the second very interesting uh, um, um, minority group is the ultra-Orthodox Jewish groups, which is a group that has uh, many cultural uh, uh, barriers towards implementing technology, towards going online, and some, we have many problems with that. Uh, and, and the third group, which I'm, I'm sure is common to all the people that are, are participating here, is digital barriers and digital security and safety for elder senior citizens, which have a lot of problems uh, when, they're, when they go online, also with accessibility to digital uh, information or, and digital services but also with security issues. Many of the cyber crimes here are, are targeting, especially phishing and, and these kinds of very simple cyber crimes, they are targeting senior citizens because it's easier to, to, uh, to uh, con them. And I will be very happy to uh, communicate with the forum and, and, and share knowledge and insight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Idan Ring. Uh, that was wonderful. I, I find it a little surprising that 90% of, 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 of people in Israel would have a problem because you are a global leader when it comes to, uh, you know, digital solutions, uh, especially in the area of cybersecurity. So I would think you would have the least amount of problem amongst all the countries there are. But I just wanted to ask yeah. you, like, what are your metrics? Like, how do you really measure that any program that you're doing has had an impact? I mean, I understand that the three projects, the, the various channels that you had presented that you go after and especially commend the fact that you really carved out the one most vulnerable and, and do specific things, you know, to be able to address them. But how do you really measure your work and its impact? And what would you like to share as a good practice for others in the world that also have very large number of vulnerable population? Yeah. Those are very good questions. Actually, I don't really have great answers for all of them. Um, I can I can say that uh, we try to do a lot of research with public awareness, and we try to uh, um, do a lot of um, uh, uh, public um, surveys to understand the level of knowledge and literacy and awareness for uh, these kinds of cyber crimes. We also use our own because we have our uh, um, um, hotline uh, uh, center, we receive calls. And this is a kind of uh, metric I think it's good to work with because it's not like, not a whole picture, but it, it's some kind of good example. If we have like 3000 people every year, we, we try to see if there is some kind of change in, in, in the, the type of, of uh, request we receive. And, and, and this gives us some kind of, of metric to understand the map of threats and the map of awareness and how people are really responding to these kinds of problems. Another thing we do is we exchange knowledge also with the authority, with the cyber authorities and with the, the cyber police units. So we try to work together to understand what are the common threats, what are the common challenges, what uh, the, the uh, um, public knows or doesn't know, and, and try to improve uh, all the time. And uh, I, I think I think you asked about what kind of like common uh, practices or best practices. I think that the most important thing to, to share 
is, is, is how to raise awareness and how to give people literacy and knowledge that can, that can uh, help them prevent. I think the most important thing we're missing out on is prevention of cybercrime. Uh, we, we really need to, to some kind, somehow work together about prevention of cybercrimes. That's first. And the second thing is the accountability of social media platforms about issues of security and safety. This is a, I think this is a very big problem we all share, and they are not accountable for what's happening online in their platforms. And I think together we, we should try and make them be more res responsible and, and respond uh, um, and faster. Great. I, I have my colleague here, uh, Dr. Prashant, that would also like to ask you a question. Yeah. yeah. Hi, uh, Hidden. So uh, my question is, uh, you know, in the Internet Society, you are kind of uh, working with the IGF, the Internet Governance Forum. So what were what are your kind yeah. of policy recommendations for the IGF? And also uh, the second part is how do you I mean, Internet governance is one area where CSO, civil society organizations have a stake and they're kind of actively represented. So I wanted to know what would you think would be an enhanced role for CSOs in the the entire gamut of internet governance. So these are the two questions that I have. Okay. I don't have enough uh, experience with, with the international uh, internet governance bodies. I wasn't part of those discussions or groups yet. So I, I don't, I, I don't, I can't really talk about the past. I, I know, I don't think it's very effective right now. And I think our role, one of the most more important roles is to work this is what I what I said about platforms, okay? About about uh, uh, companies, uh, private owned companies that that part of them are 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 today the place where a lot of cyber crimes happen, and and sometimes the, the countries, the state, police uh, uh, authorization, the authorities, security authorities, it's very hard for them to work inside these platforms, and uh, because they're private, and I think. One of our roles together as an international civil society body is, 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 is to uh, uh, um, demand more accountability and answers and some kind of dialogue with these international uh, platforms and private uh, companies. I think this is very important if, we, if you talk about internet government. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Much. Dan. For... Thank you very much for the opportunity for your thoughts. Now we would like to go to the next speaker. Um, in my opinion, she's quite a star, Ms. Francesca Bosco from Cyber Peace Institute. Thank you so much and uh, no pressure. <laughs> Thank you so much for the introduction and uh, it's a pleasure to, to come actually um, after uh, two distinguished speakers already and I'm very much looking forward to hear from, uh, from all of you. Thank you so much um, to the uh, organizers for the opportunity to present the work of the Institute and also to share with you some of our reflections and also some of the kind of like lessons learned and uh, uh, some concrete um, um, projects, initiatives uh, that we put in place. I'm also sharing maybe uh, some links uh, in the in the chat. So um, if you want to reach out, uh, we would be uh, very happy to collaborate. So just to give you um, a little bit of context, the, the Cyber Peace Institute was created in uh, 2019 um, as a pretty unique civil society organization because it's able to respond to the increase of cyber attacks against critical sectors like critical infrastructure, but also critical actors like NGOs. Um, by analyzing cyber attacks, so we have a very strong technical backbone, assisting vulnerable communities thanks to our assistance team, and also create a dialogue between the civil society, governments, the private sector, the academic environment, in a, in a sector that is, as you know, um, has been traditionally, I would say, very much dominated by private sector and government. Um, especially because there was the need and understanding the key role of global digital transformation um, that is kind of like deeply changing the way that people and organizations function at an unprecedented pace. And technology and cyberspace, as we are discussing here, become critical to address also global crises, for example, 
Cyber attacks, unfortunately, are escalating at an alarming pace at the same time. So these attacks are also a reminder that cyberspace is not virtual and uh, they impede the, the achievement of the SDGs, that they threaten human life, uh, and especially they target people's ability to access, for example, critical services like water, food, healthcare, finance, energy. So the focus of the Institute is really to assist vulnerable communities when it comes to closest, let's say, to loss of life if impacted. So critical sectors like healthcare, critical actors like NGOs, but also how specific contexts can create vulnerability. A good example is, uh, for example, targeted surveillance uh, like spyware um, against uh, uh, certain, uh, uh, certain actors, uh, uh, particularly active in the human rights sphere, human rights defense sphere. Or, for example, in the current ongoing conflict in Ukraine that uh, exacerbates and also potentially creates a new vulnerability, and I share some, uh, some link in the chat. Uh, where we where we work, we have a global mandate and outreach, but we truly believe that we need, let's say, to to go from local to global and the other way around. This is why, for um, uh, specifically our assistance activities, um, we work with uh, regional coordinators. For example, one is based in Nairobi, one is based in Bogota, uh, and also via our network of partners. And so, this is also kind of like a call for you in case you want to partner with us. Uh, um, it would be super helpful. How we work, well, especially in the field of policy, policies might, must be designed to serve the communities they cater to, and policymakers and implementers must continuously question whether these are basically working as intended. And so we really advocate for an intersectional approach towards cybersecurity. On one hand, enable civil society and government, for example, academia and private sector to work together. And I give you a couple of, uh, of examples, as I mentioned, from global to global and vice versa. And then it was also mentioned before, a human-centric approach based on human rights, diversity, equity, and inclusion when it comes to cybersecurity. How we work with, for example, uh, different type of stakeholders. We engage in global and regional policy negotiations that are in line with institute strategic objectives and mandates. So for example, human rights, law, humanitarian development, uh, healthcare, as we mentioned before, for example, like the targeted surveillance, uh, accountability. We want to support with our unique capability to, to bring the data on the table. So try to support the policymakers and our partners with the data-driven knowledge and also to link it to international cooperation discussions, basically to help decrease potentially uh, the geopolitical tensions. Uh, we're active in several fora. Um, we, we participated to the IGF. Uh, we're currently attending, I have a colleague attending now the uh, open-ended working group in, uh, in New York. And uh, we also engage in the ad hoc committee on cybercrime. I shared some resources in the chat. Um, we are working with uh, the OSCD because they have a dedicated uh, civil society, Isaac. And uh, uh, we've been very active also in engaging, for example, with the Paris Peace Forum since we signed. Um, these are kind of like a set of examples. And uh, another part is we are particularly focusing creating the dialogue for civil society organization, international organizations, and for example, states also to identify a common language to work together. One key point is consider cybersecurity as an enabler for sustainable development. To this end, for example, with the Global Forum on Cyber Expertise, the World Bank and the World Economic Forum, we're working together um, on a pretty, a, a, a pretty key topic that was also mentioned before, capacity building. So we're working towards a global cyber capacity building conference, bridging communities that have been in siloed for for quite some time. So for example, development and cybersecurity community with a focus on global south and at all level from ministerial to civil society. 
Um, other example is that, for example, we uh, we we try to have an approach that is a cross cutting. So um, we we recently uh, had uh, together with uh, uh, one of our partners um, a training on internet policies provided to the ambassadors, for example, of the African Union and developing countries. So the G77 mission in Geneva, and uh, it was a training that was uh, dealing not only. Uh, with cybersecurity, but with all the issues related to digital transformation and digital policies for sustainable development. So having this sort of like multidisciplinary and cross-cutting approach. And then the last point is to support uh, then other civil society organizations to build their organizational resilience and their capacity to participate in the policy dialogue. We have a dedicated program. It's called the Cyber Peace Builders uh, that is uh, supporting for free civil society organizations in need. And uh, we also launched uh, uh, a week ago on World NGO Day, the Humanitarian Cybersecurity Center that is providing assistance to NGOs, but also uh, support when it comes to participating to uh, policy debates and also uh, developing together some technical tools. Um, I would like to finish with uh, uh, the, let's say, the, the key policy suggestions that we think should be considered and a couple of examples of how we can measure them. So first, uh, ensure a focus on human-centric approach to achieve peace and security. So to, to maintain, basically, to well, to create and maintain, I would say in this moment, international peace and security, uh, we really need to have uh, the people, the individuals, uh, um, at the center, uh, because we would like to see cyberspace uh, as a place where they can enjoy fundamental rights and freedoms, as well as rights to economic and social advancement. How we do this also to have a little bit of like a shift, not only on the data, meaning like how many cyber attacks or how much they cost, but also how much they harm people. What is the real impact on people of cyber attacks? The importance of multi-stakeholder approach was mentioned already before, and indeed, we truly believe that safety and security in cyberspace requires a collective effort and cooperation of a different, of a, a quite a diversified range of stakeholders. Um, and civil society can particularly contribute with a unique knowledge on how potential threats impact human rights and human security. For example, it was also mentioned uh, um, before, and, and unfortunately, is the is the right day, let's say, to to have it in mind. Also, for example, gender based threats and impacts. Um, the focus on on importance of cybersecurity for collective security, safety, and respect of rights and freedoms. It's not as we, we need to move out from the siloed approach of sectors, of actors, um, of ecosystems. We need really to understand the interconnectedness and the digitalization of our society. And therefore, we need to have in mind security as something that is really like kind of like the backbone um, of trust and also the right, the human rights and uh, the long-term resilience. Um, I just would like to finish with a couple of areas that uh, we've been uh, very active on, uh, and we also issued uh, uh, some specific submission to um, uh, high-level policy uh, ongoing processes. So for example, the protection of international organizations and non-governmental organizations, because they are the ones that we always say they are the last mile, right? So they are the closest one to, to, to society. And so they, we need to make sure that, um, we, we need to call for an end to cyber attacks against these organizations, the, their operations and their data, their staff, their volunteers, and also the beneficiaries ultimately of their activities. As well as we need to call for an end to um, attacks against the critical infrastructure because they are clearly providing essential services. And then I would I would say um, it was a little bit touched um, in, in the previous comments, also preserve the universal character of the internet because indeed the fragmentation of internet creates further boundaries in cyberspace and also increase the risk of information vacuum and the spread of misinformation, disinformation that really undermines basically the internet as, as the, the motor of global <laughs> development as we would like to, to, to see. 
Um, and then the last but not least that it was also mentioned before, capacity building and, and inclusion. So for sure, it needs to be an integral part on about any type of policy uh, that touches upon cybersecurity. Let me finish with a couple of examples, how to measure. It's always like uh, uh, the, the kind of like very difficult question to answer because uh, um, as well as there are not um, kind of like internationally agreed the definitions uh, is also very difficult uh, therefore to measure, uh, let's say, what we are not able to define. Um, we specifically when it comes to laws and policies, we, we put in place uh, um, uh, one um, one approach. So basically, and I can I can share it in the chat. Um, when um, COVID hit, and so uh, the healthcare sector started also to be particularly vulnerable to cyber attacks as well. Um, due to the increased digitalization, we started thinking, okay, let's collect the data and let's collect the information about cyber attacks, how they impact society, but also which are the laws and policies that, that they are violating and how laws and policies can help instead to advance protection. Similar approach we are taking with uh, um, a platform that is publicly available by which we are tracking cyber attacks uh, in times of conflict, and specifically uh, we are working on the Ukraine conflict case in the tracking attacks against the civilian infrastructure and providing consideration on laws and policies that might drive regulatory change. There are also some consideration clearly on IHL. And then the, the last part is that by the end of the year, we will develop what we call a cyber peace watch. Um, with kind of like four functions, on one hand to document cybersecurity governance instruments, track accountability and measure responsible behavior, analyze malicious activity and assess the societal impact. It's still in the making, but if you have any ideas and, uh, and, and if you're willing to contribute, we would be um, uh, very much welcoming uh, support. And I thank you for your attention and I look forward to, to continue our collaboration. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I mean, uh, you know, the work that you do at CyberPeace, especially your dedication to really support NGOs and CSOs is very, very commendable. I think for, for, for most people, this would be, uh, you know, a good thing to have such an organization to reach out to. And I really hope that there are many more that are dedicated in such uh, service orientedness. I just will ask one quick, one small question. You know, we always talk about training and, and really the need for capacity building, but this area is such that it is evolving so fast, so quickly. So how do you really put, you know, a wrap around how much training, you know, how much information is necessary, like the previous speaker, Ilan mentioned, you know, we should be able to protect ourselves. Is that even possible? Or is it like, you know, not yet is my current state of affairs. Like I've not been subjected to a cyber attack of any sort, or I've not been hurt so far, but it's potentially possible, you know, irrespective of the types of precautions I take. I, I just find it hard to really understand what is the amount of training, how much, or is this something that's always going to be a changing target, a moving target? <laughs> you, you like to ask uh, impossible questions. <laughs> so thank you for the impossible question. So uh, the answer is uh, yes and no at the same time. Uh, will it always change? Yes. Uh, changing at the uh, pace of like a technology development. Uh, and uh, I've been working in cybersecurity for almost all my life. And uh, I remember one, one, one like uh, kind of like big learning is like every new technology might open the door to new forms of basically of threats at the same time. Um, so for sure, we need to, let's say, to, to keep the pace. Uh, I think there is also another angle. I think what we have to focus on is, on one hand, not only look at the sophistication and the progress, but also to increase uh, the baseline, which is, uh, um, I think, the, um, the, the, the most urgent need. We, this is also why, for example, previous speakers are uh, um, uh, uh, talking about, uh, for example, en enhancing uh, digital literacy, uh, which is uh, basically the, 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 the foundational bucket when you want also uh, to build uh, uh, capacity when it comes to cybersecurity. So there is one part. The second part is, and again, a broken record moment, but the multi-stakeholder community is desperately needed here because there are... Um, let's say, pocket of knowledge that if they're not put together, 
you cannot really advance when it comes to cybersecurity. I think it's really like kind of like almost under the era where you have like only super specialized training when it comes to cybersecurity necessarily. And, and I give a practical example. What we do at the Institute is that, for example, uh, we assist uh, um, civil society organizations in need, also providing them training, but also working with private sector companies that, that are offering their volunteers. And one of the things that, for example, we are doing is that they might be super skilled when it comes to, um, let's say, the, the, the latest uh, uh, cyber threat intelligence techniques, but they maybe they lack, for example, soft skills area. They lack the policy understanding that might be extremely relevant when then uh, you want to support, for example, civil society organizations in need. So this is a practical example of how we need to move on one hand, increase the baseline, and on the other hand, the multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder approach. Great. Thank you so much, Francesca. I have so many, many more questions, but due to lack of time, I think we'll have to move on. I will continue my conversations with you also uh, later on. Now I'd love to invite um, Mr. Eduardo Perillo from the Association of Technology, Education, Development, Research and Communication, a person with a large portfolio and has done so much work for the civil society. Thank you so much uh, for the kind introduction. Um, so hi all, I hope everyone is doing great. My name is Eduardo and I am co-executive director of TEDIC. Just uh, for people who perhaps doesn't know organization, uh, TDIC is a Paraguayan non-governmental non organization with the mission to defend and promote human rights in the digital environment. Saying we had like different topics of interest, but among the main are freedom of expression, privacy, access to knowledge, and gender on the internet. And within those intersections, one of the topics that we've been closely following are security policies at the intersection with transparency and digital technologies. So, uh, for those who also don't necessarily know the Latin American context, press and different civil society organizations in Latin America are doing uh, and are reporting a growing techno technologization of public security policies in recent years, particularly in borders. And within our case, this trend is visible in the triple border area, which is an area shared by three countries, Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. Um, because it's a very strategic and geopolitical area, not only for the region, but also for international actors due to a lot of contextual situations of drug trafficking, a lot of commerce, and a lot of human trafficking at the same time. And also because it has one of the largest hydroelectric plants on the planet. It was the biggest on the planet until two years ago, where I think China uh, beat us in that uh, particular metric. Uh, and like I said, it has a vital circulation of people, goods, and services. So um, we consider that it was necessary to shed more light on how these security and technology uh, policies are being deployed uh, in the region, particularly the security and intelligence policies. So we have partnered with a Brazilian organization called the Privacy Brazil, and also with a UK organization called uh, Privacy International. And we have uh, jointly uh, mapped these different intelligence and security policies that have digital components. So I'm sorry I'm being very contextual in this situation, but I thought it was interesting to bring that particular approach in my intervention because it, in the end it connects very much to a lot of the G20 members that through international cooperation or through bilateral agreements with Global South countries promote this kind of technologies and deployment of technologies in the region because they end up feeding their own databases. Um, so the first one is the Integrated Borders Operations Center. This is a Brazilian public security program whose objective is to combat transnational organized crime and integrate different public security agents to centralize information under one roof, which particularly means that they are integrating different intelligence databases and is inspired in EU and US integrated operations centers uh, that are across those territories for a long time now at the moment. Um, the other two programs are more visible. Let's say CEOF in a way is the one that is invisible for people who are in those areas and who are subject of intelligence monitoring. Um, we have Morale Intelligente, uh, which aims to implant, investigate, and develop intelligent technology solutions to combat better smuggling, mismanagement, and trafficking of weapons and drugs in the triple border area. Uh, 
Mural, which is important to say is that Mural Inteligente is one of the arms of a larger project called Frontera Tech, which is a border surveillance program promoting digital technologies with a public security focus, particularly through deployment of drones and uh, cameras with facial recognition uh, technologies. The last one is a SMARF, which is a new migration control technology that was implemented in the Paraguayan side of the triple border area, and it was then exported to the um, biggest international airport in the country here in the capital in Asuncion. And it's an automated mechanism for registering people moving across borders based on facial recognition. Um, so I would say like perhaps I'm gonna be more brief than my colleagues in my intervention, but I would say that the concerns at the intersection of transparency and safety policies that intersect with digital technologies policies, and I, which is I think one of the main topics we are here to discuss today is uh, that the findings that we have points that neither of these policies, for instance, um, let's say, uh, let me rephrase that. Um, for each of the policies that we have found, the, 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 the three policies in questions, the narrative and efficiency uh, to speed policies processes within the triple border area dominates the deployment of digital technologies for border control specifically. And this efficiency is an absolute value that tends to ignore an open debate to identify the risk of human rights violations and mitigate them as appropriate. So we're not necessarily talking about the necessity of rejecting this kind of policies, but what is the due process and what is the process in place from a public management perspective that can ensure the enjoyment of human rights. And this is not something that has to be invented. We know that human rights impact assessments exist, or even data protection impact assessments for those countries who have uh, privacy and data protection provisions within their legislations, even though those are not necessarily enough. But uh, for at least the Mural Intelligente and the uh, SMART system in Paraguay, and also the sea of Intelligence Database Integration Project, neither of those programs have human rights impact assessments. Um, and there is a confusion by policymakers in terms of how to, let's say, incorporate these processes within their public designing uh, methodologies. Uh, in the case of the Moral Intelligente program, for instance, there was no mapping of possible human rights risks within the project. Uh, and in the case of, this map, of the Paraguayan smart system, uh, there was a doubt regarding even implementing these systems because similar initiatives already exist. So they would think or they consider that this kind of implement, that this kind of policy, this kind of uh, provisions uh, would be redundant, uh, specifically by the uh, migration authority. None of the policies have privacy policies. And although some institutions from both countries responded to freedom of access to information requests in an exhaustive matters, there is still a component of lack of transparency uh, that characterized all these programs, particularly the CF1 because of the intelligence component that tends to reject freedom of expression, uh, freedom of access to information uh, requests because of national security provisions, which in the Paraguayan case is not regulated. So there's a big gap there and a big, let's say, uh, gray line that allows to enforce a lot of uh, policies that are not friendly to transparency. And lastly, in the, and in the case of the sea of case, which I think is a very interesting one, there was a, an interesting complementation in the findings in the Brazilian and in the Paraguayan border sites uh, regarding international actors' involvement uh, in deploying those technologies. In the case of the Paraguayan side, uh, we identified the interest of the European Union in promoting the adoption of integrated centers such as the Sea of in the area. And in the Brazilian side, we identified a significant US presence in the Sea of implementation because let's remember this is a policy that is from Brazil that was then escalated to Paraguay through direct invitations uh, from the Brazilian government to include intelligence databases from the Paraguayan side to that sea of database uh, that is controlled by the Brazilian government. Um, so like I said, there was a significant presence of the US in implementing the sea of implementation through funding visits from Brazilian officials to US fusion centers in El Paso, Mexico and other, uh, other places where they have this kind of policies in place. But however, the safeguards that countries like the US or territories like the EU have when deploying these kind of technologies are not exported uh, in this 
in, in the, let's say, uh, versions that countries like Paraguay and Brazil uh, implement here locally. So no privacy provisions, no human rights impact assessments, like I said, no data protections impact ass assessments whatsoever, which are not the same as human rights impact assessments anyways. And we think this is a problematic issue uh, from a policy and a public admin perspective that intersects a lot with some of the things that you were talking uh, in terms of critical infrastructures, in, in terms of cybersecurity of the people and not necessarily only cybersecurity of the systems and the list can go on uh, quite a lot. So, I guess this was some, uh, something that we wanted to share that we think uh, could very much connect with other ongoing processes within uh, this presentation and within the C20 G20 uh, lobby advocacy strategy. So thank Fantastic. you so much thank for you. the time. Yeah, thank, thank you, Edward. Uh, I think uh, very, very comprehensive suggestions and I think very good, I think pointers that you have given to potential, you know, collaborations that can really you know, help solve. And also you really nicely highlighted places that are really taking on importance, uh, you know, when, it look, when, you, when you're really doing a lot of cross-border, uh, you know, type of activities. So I think they are all highly, highly relevant. Um, I think we have to taken all of them down. So thank you so much for your uh, input into this policy dialogue and we will continue to work with you uh, for the rest of the time. And I know, the next G20 is coming very close by to your country. So I know you will be playing a, a, a very active role there as well. So thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, just due to paucity of time, we are not able to ask all the questions and comments that are coming up on the chat, but we'll just move on to the next speaker. Uh, Mr. David White from Bank of International Settlements. Um, wow, this is such a huge organization that I can't even fathom and we are so grateful to have his presence uh, on to you, uh, Mr. David White. So thank you so much for the invitation today. Um, uh, actually truly uh, fascinating discussion so far and I'm really happy to be a part of this. So um, I do have a few slides about the bank just because not everyone might be familiar with it, but I promise you I will not uh, dwell too, too long on there and, and actually I think get to the more substantive discussion um, maybe some of the issues. So um, anyway, my name is David White and I head up the Cyber Resilience Coordination Center at the Bank for International Settlements. We're located in Basel, Switzerland. Uh, for those of you who don't know who we are, which I'm not surprised uh, prior to joining the bank, I didn't know what the Bank for International Settlements did either. But um, our mission is really to support central banks globally um, and if you think of uh, financial stability of the of the financial sector, um, this this is our, our main remit in terms of international cooperation. So um, we're a forum for dialogue. Um, we do things like uh, innovation and knowledge sharing through our innovation hubs. We have seven globally and two regional uh, offices, one in Mexico City, one in Hong Kong. Uh, we issue a number of uh, uh, public policy papers when it comes to things like um, anything to do in the financial sector, whether it is pure economic, and again, now more in the innovation space, if you think of fintech and that sort of thing, uh, we're very active. Um, and then obviously we are a bank, uh, believe it or not, not a commercial bank, we actually deal with central banks itself. And to give you some additional context, um, all uh, G20 members are, are, are again, are composed a subset of our shareholders. So we have 63 central banks uh, that are members or shareholders for the Bank for International Settlements, um, about 95% of the world GDP. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, where do I sit? Um, there was um, a, a recognition that we needed, that we, as in the Bank for International Settlements, needed to do a little bit more with respect to cybersecurity and cyber resilience. Uh, within the financial ecosystem. And of course, we had a great platform, if you will, in terms of having 63 central banks uh, that we, we kind of meet with regularly. So my area does things like knowledge sharing, collaboration, and operational readiness. So I uh, have a very um, wonderful job in terms of interacting and in a, in a kind of a global footprint of if you think of all of those in, uh, individuals within the central bank trying to protect the central bank itself and by extension, uh, the financial sector domestically in each one of these countries. Um, so again, quite, quite active in that space. Um, there's an annual report, of course, uh, that I can provide the, uh, which is available on our website if you're interested in more of what we do. Uh, next slide, please. And some of the things that we do at the CRCC, uh, which again, I won't go into too much detail, 
um, things like cyber range exercises, and actually we're holding one right now. Uh, so we have 30 central banks here uh, in Switzerland, uh, live red blue team defending um, pretty realistic simulated central bank environments against sophisticated uh, attacks. So it's a way for us to promote uh, a little bit of uh, knowledge sharing, also some training, but really it's just to build those relationships globally uh, among the different operation centers so that if there ever was a wide scale event, uh, we, we, we definitely would be able to come together as a determined community. Cybersecurity seminars, uh, we do benchmarking exercises uh, with using a cyber resilience assessment from Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and we have a secure collaboration platform. And, and I'm delighted to say that, um, again, uh, each one of your countries, uh, uh, all central banks, of course, um, have availed themselves of these kind of offerings. Uh, next slide, please. And so this is, I guess, where I'd like to just maybe spend a, a moment. Um, yeah, I've, I've spent many, many years um, uh, in the cybersecurity field uh, prior to the Bank for International Settlements. I was in a governmental agency doing both offensive and defensive uh, cybersecurity. And, uh, you know, the things that I've seen over the last uh, many years, um, obviously, if I think of the financial sector itself, um, it really demands a high standard of cyber resilience. Uh, item two is something that I think I've seen really on a personal level change over the last uh, five to 10 years. And it's what I call the democratization of very sophisticated attack tools. So uh, the cyber threat landscape has absolutely changed. I would have said to you five years ago, some of the tools, the, the malware, um, the attacks that we're seeing uh, would have been probably the sole domain of a nation state or, or state sponsored in terms of level of sophistication, uh, the, the tooling available, the technical expertise, that, that's no longer the case. The, these attack tools are, are freely available on the web. Uh, furthermore, vulnerabilities can be purchased. So the threat landscape has absolutely changed. Um, the other is, um, uh, you know, I'm, a, uh, I'm a, an engineer by heart. I love to buy things and new technology, but, but I can tell you, um, you know, compliance is not really security. It doesn't equate to resilience. And I think we need to move past, you know, uh, simply saying, yes, I'm using a cybersecurity framework as a checkbox exercise at one point in time, uh, because as, as we know, we, we need to move into thinking less about cybersecurity and more about resilience. Um, and that is, you know, how, how much impact can the organization take and still deliver the mission critical services? And, and again, what I would say is even, even within our community, the, the responses are still fragmented. Information sharing um, across all critical infrastructure sectors, I, I dare I would say, um, there's certainly ISACs that, that are available to do a great job. But I think we, we could do more as, as a community. And I think this, if I think of more in, in organizational enterprise spaces, is absolutely the case. But, uh, you know, I was actually inspired by, by Eden, um, the work that you're doing there, the, the talk about, you know, greater cybersecurity awareness. And, and the, I think these are, are where we can make some ex extreme strides um, in, in safeguarding, you know, sec you know, security from the ground up. And a, a lot of it has to do with, with education. The, the, the second thing is, yeah, I think there are certainly classes of us that take our privacy quite seriously. There, there's others that I think are, are just after the latest, greatest, application and technology no one can read those user agreements no one reads the eulas and at that point they you know they're maybe they're not aware of exactly how much they're giving up and again i don't think we can ask you know big big tech won't move on its own uh, so this is something maybe banding together to make people more aware of this and demand more from from these vendors so with respect to actions um you know, I, I think a collective response. Now, I don't want to talk about the financial sector. We could talk about any critical infrastructure. We could talk about at the governmental level. We could talk at the community level. You know, how do we disrupt large scale attacks and deter future attacks? We, we need to work together. Um, things we've talked about before in international reporting framework. I literally could have put this slide up five, five years in the past and I would have the same bullets here. I mean, we need we need to make more uh, you know, cover more ground in this space, capacity building. And I put here building a determined community of cybersecurity experts. That is, you know, how, how do we get those like-minded individuals, the right tools, the training to be able to help defend their respective, um, you know, whether it's enter enterprises, homes, what have you. But a lot of that also has to do with just, just basic awareness as well. Um, and information sharing. Again, uh, the, the ISACs, I see FS ISAC is at least uh, purported to be one of the speakers here. I mean, 
th these are the types of initiatives that we need to support. But, um, you know, I, I, I still hear things about, you know, we, we need to come up with common terms and a lexicon. We, we need to find a way to share, share more um, tactical threat information. Honestly, that's been solved. It's, if you talk to the practitioners in the community, th these types of things exist today. There, there needs to be a will to be able to do it. And the last thing I'll probably uh, end on here is uh, I think there's a real tension between, uh, you know, government and, and private sector. If you think of, you know, government institutions themselves um, are both in the offensive and defensive game. If you take a look at pri private um, sector, they absolutely have the reach and the expertise, uh, probably even more so than some governments now to be able to make a demonstrable impact when it comes to a large uh, deterring a large scale attack or uh, helping the, you know, the users with better security, and we need to demand more from them. Uh, someone mentioned the, the recent conflict, um, in, in, in Ukrainian conflict. If, for those that recall, this was, there was an unprecedented intervention by the private sector um, in Ukraine to help identify and deter some very sophisticated attacks. So this is possible. It's just how do we work together to, to actually try to action or influence this to make the internet more secure, more accessible by all. And I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, uh, uh, David. It was really, I think you touched key points, I think that are really resonating here continuously. And you very correctly summarize saying that, you know, five years ago too, we had probably similar problems and we need to really go faster in covering our ground. Uh, especially the fact that, uh, you know, compliance is really not security. I think not, I, that very fact is not really uh, something that most people are aware about and, and uh, getting people to really accept. I mean, I'm really surprised. I mean, you know, one is that you are actually an authority and you said, uh, you know, 95% of the GDP really uh, are, uh, you know, uh, work with you, right? Mm -hmm. And and you are in a tight position today to be able to help and support the cause. Why is it that people do not, why are there no regulations for mandated mm -hmm. information sharing? Why, are, why is there no incentivization for that? Any thoughts around that so that we can try, any, try to look at that more? Because we, this particular mm -hmm. point has been, you know, mentioned earlier on by earlier speakers mm -hmm. also, that it's a very, very key thing from your uh, experience. What is the real key issue here that really right. is not mandating that? Yeah. So, so again, just to be careful, my 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 role is really about um, fostering collaboration and bringing the environment to bring the shareholders or all these central banks together and 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 really building that determined community. You know, if I give you my personal opinion, um, it's just very difficult from an international level. Um, you know, I I made a statement about hey, you know, we we don't need to talk about terms and cyber lexicons and way in technical ways to share we, that's been it has but i don't i don't think it has been at the governmental level there there are absolutely differing opinions when it comes to the cyberspace and if i put you know my pre, my in my previous role um, in some domains, you know, it, it was always steering, look, um, you know, it, it's widely known and reported that government agencies have an offensive cyber capability, but maybe we can put it, put it in the lane of espionage and, and, and you know, a diplo po political type things, stay away from intellectual property, stay, stay, stay away from critical infrastructure. Um, other governments might, want, might not want to play in that. There's always this distrust if we, you know, sign an agreement, does it prevent us from doing something yet others won't abide for it? So I think it's just, a, it's a very, it's, a, it's an extension, uh, you know, of a, sov a sovereign right to, to, to be able to execute its own security apparatus. So intrinsically, I think it's just very difficult. The talent manuals, obviously, if you take a look, and again, I'm not, not a lawyer by trade, I'm an engineer. Um, but if you take a look at those in terms of the state of international regulation, I think it's a very important, um, you know, it's, it's a very important area. I know it's actively being, explored. And uh, it's really difficult, I think, to kind of get consensus in that larger scale. But I think of what could we do at the grassroots? Um, you know, I, I, you know, to, to me, it's not always about better technology. It's about more user awareness of how to use the technology and demanding more accountability from big tech, demanding more accountability from, from your government in order to make it more secure. And we need to unify. And I think that would actually, you know, we could, you know, traction could, could be had there. 
um, I think. But again, just my personal opinion. Thank you so much. I really appreciate those thoughts and those comments. And we'll definitely take those actionable policy recommendations into consideration to include them as well. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, let's just move on to the next speaker, Nathan Pacha from Google. Yeah, and uh, I also have some slides, if those could get pulled up. And yeah, just uh, so I've spent the last six years uh, here at Google, and my primary focus is protecting advertisers from fake traffic. So I have a, a very business, uh, business actor centric view, and that's what my, my recommendations uh, focus on. And the fraudsters that I deal with, uh, the ones that are most successful, they commit fraud at scale using multiple accounts uh, and defrauding multiple victims. And so to better protect against business fraud, uh, I'm proposing a framework around thinking about using digital identities. Okay, next slide. Yep. Uh, so just a, a quick foundation, right, is that uh, trust is super critical for uh, economic growth and for having efficient economic systems. And here's a, a quote that I pulled out and I have the, the reference down at the bottom. But if we think about our you know, in-person lives, in the real world, non-digital, uh, if, if there's a local vendor down the street from you that you buy food from or buy clothing from, uh, you've built up that relationship over lots and lots of uh, interactions, right? And uh, because that's a, a multi-interaction type of thing, uh, there's a lot less incentive for them to defraud you, you know, to uh, to sell you a low, low quality piece of clothing or something, because then they would lose your trust and the trust of the community. And it would be additionally expensive for them to go to another community and set up and build that trust for a couple of years to maybe just defraud people for, uh, for not a, a whole lot of money. Um, but the problem with digital communities is if you can create a new account for almost no cost, uh, you can burn through those accounts and even making a couple dollars per account could possibly be profitable for a fraudster at scale. So if we can focus on businesses and, uh, yes, yeah, so, so next slide. Yeah, so when we, uh, or actually go back one slide, sorry. Yeah, okay, so, so scale fraud, right? Either uh, multiple accounts or maximizing the fraud for a single account. So uh, to basically put the brakes on both of those uh, four business accounts, uh, if we require an authenticated digital human identity uh, linked to that account, right? Then that ties into the, the reputation uh, and the consequences for the human that's operating that account. Uh, and then to, and, and also, right, you would only allow one digital business account per actual real human business operator identity. So they couldn't create multiple ones. Uh, and then to slow the rate of fraud for a single account, uh, you could have transaction limits where they would need to develop a track record maybe of lower transact transaction limits uh, before those would get raised. So last slide, the framework. Yeah, so here's the framework, how, how ways in which uh, we could think about this, right? Like the, the cost factor, we want to make that asymmetrical for, for asymmetrically low for good actors, asymmetrically high for bad actors. Um, just as with the real world, right? You, your reputation, uh, either as a fraudster or a non-fraudster uh, needs to follow you around some. Uh, and then I also have ones about how transaction limits could possibly be thinking about. And of course, uh, this would, would need to be integrated and portable. So it would be cross-platform and have validity you know, across borders also. So yeah, that, that's what I want to share today. Yeah, thank you for, uh, thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Nathan. Um, I think you you have presented a good, perhaps, approach to be able to build trust. Uh, I don't know if I have the liberty to question you as a Google employee or not. 
I won't put you in a tight spot, but obviously there are many questions we could ask Google on, you know, what really drives their business models and whether they're really uh, civil society, pro-civil society. <laughs> so uh, anyway, my, my, my hope is to really provide this exposure that ad-driven business models really have caused a lot of discomfort and you know spread of disinformation and things like that and we are hoping like giants like you will you know take this types of uh, you know comments into consideration and and i hope a lot of work will be happening at google to be really supporting uh, you know civil society i mean fundamentally trust is is so 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 important but in the name of trust, I think people do not disclose some of those weaknesses in the system. So, or they worry about the lack of trust uh, from disclosing. And this is really the kind of paradox here. Um, I would say, uh, you know, when you're really talking about trust, how can you really transparently rebuild trust? Uh, and, you know, what are some mechanisms for that? And how far has the uh, private industry gone to be able to support the civil society in that regard would be something I would really pose to you. Um, maybe we will have a longer discussion uh, for sure uh, in uh, you know in the coming weeks. But I really thank you for your thoughts, and we will take that very much into consideration. Uh, thank yes. you, so much, Nathan. Next, we have um, Andrea Zagedi from TechSoup Europe. Uh, welcome, Andrea. Um, hello, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, I have a presentation. I don't know whether it's possible to pull it up or not. I can do it without as well. So um, I work for TechSoup Europe, which is part of the um, uh, TechSoup Global Network. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so our mission is to build a dynamic bridge that leverages technology to enable connections and innovative solutions for a more equitable planet. Our headquarters, as you can probably guess, is in San Francisco, but we have regional centers around the world. And I, I work for the European uh, branch. So what, what is TechSoup? So it's a global network. Um, we work uh, with partner organizations, a lot of them around the world, um, which uh, helps us to be at the same time global and local because we gather a lot of local knowledge um, through our partners. Um, we learn about the needs of the civil society organizations and um, we also can channel in um, those needs through the global network and then spread it around. Um, what we do is basically we support um, the digital transformation of civil society organizations. We mostly work with small and mid-sized uh, nonprofits around the world. Um, we have a portfolio of products um, services, solutions, trainings, and courses. So we try to, to provide not only um, technical tools, but also the knowledge and skills um, for um, civil society practitioners so that they can basically work more efficiently and, and contribute um, as much as they can to um, civil society and the society um, at large. Um, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So as you can see, it's a global network. These are the countries that current, we currently uh, cover. Um, we don't have partners in all of them, but some of our partners are responsible for multiple geographical areas. And we, we serve uh, more than a million organizations around the world. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so we founded the Civil Society Security Strengthening Initiative a um, um, few years back because we saw the need from um, the civil society uh, actors um, for, for more focus on, on security. So as, as we do it with all the areas that we cover, um, we have products in our catalog, for example, like antivirus. Uh, software, but also we have services like 
know before has recently um, joined our initiative. And so they offered, for example, 5,000 licenses to onboard nonprofit organizations. Um, that part, part of it is um, online trainings for nonprofits um, to be more alert, to be more aware of the security threats from CEO fraud to um to to other threats that um the people speaking before me mentioned uh, but also it's uh, they provide for example um simulated phishing attacks which uh, which also helps to build uh, the nonprofit organizations like a human shield for their organization not only protect themselves but also the people they serve um so th this is what we started and we currently have um one grant for Europe uh, that we are rolling out right now, uh, but we are working together with uh, not only companies, but also state actors in some cases, uh, and we have grants from all over the world. Um, we can go to the last slide, thank you. Uh, so our, what we would like to emphasize in this group um, is that we think it's it's really important um, to work together with state actors, but also for-profit organizations, so that we can leverage technology better in the in a civil society, especially for for um, safety and security. And cybersecurity, we think, is critical to the resiliency of um, of civil society today. And we are very dedicated to to support them along the way to become safer. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrea. Great work, a great summary indeed. And I think we need a lot more people like you to really cater to the needs of the civil society. I really appreciate your time and the thoughts that you have shared with us. Thank you so much. Next, we will really go to uh, Ms. Sylvia. Calderon, uh, she is from iPandetic and uh, coming all the way from Panama. Buenos días a todos. Eh, soy Silvia Calderón y voy a presentar en español. Eh, actualmente trabajo para la asociación de la, el Instituto de Panamericano de Derecho y Tecnología que está basado en Panamá. Eh, soy de Guatemala y les voy a presentar la 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 presentación. Eh, okay. no sé si me... Disculpame un segundo para poderte traducir. Gracias. Um, she said, um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sylvia Calderon, and I work for the Pan Panamanian Institute of Rights and Technology. Um, the institute is based in Panama, but I'm from Guatemala, and she is going to present her slides. Y Pandetec es una organización sin fines de lucro que promueve el uso y la regulación de nuevas tecnologías y el respeto de los derechos humanos en el entorno digital. Un momento. Mm. Okay. So, Pandetec is a non-profit and we promote the use and regulations of new technology and um, we also promote the implement and the use of rights in the digital um, like surroundings. Eh, Ipandetec tiene incidencia en Centroamérica, Guatemala, El Salvador, eh, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panamá, Costa Rica y República Dominicana. Eh, fue fundado en el 2012 por Lee Hernández. So Ipanditec is located, well, it's in Central America and there's, um, it's also, it's in Guatemala, Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Panama, Costa Rica, and Dominican Republic. And it was founded in 2012 by Leah Hernandez. Actualmente, como trabajo de la organización, realizamos monitoreo legislativo, estudio de protección de datos, también estudios sobre datos abiertos, biométricos, cifrado, cibercrimen, ciberseguridad, entre otros. Um, right now, we work in uh, monitoring studies on legislation, we work on data protection, 
open data, um, biometric data, um, ciphering and cybersecurity and other things. El año pasado también eh, se implementó el proyecto Seguras en Línea, hackeando la violencia digital. Es un proyecto que busca visibilizar con datos eh, la violencia digital que sufren las mujeres y eh, sectores vulnerables como la población LBGTIQ+. Um, last year, we implemented our program called... Um, Disculpa, ¿cuál es el nombre? Perdón. Seguras en línea, ¿correcto? Línea. Ajá, sí. Seguras en línea. Was, last year we implemented the program called Seguras en línea. And basically what it is about is hacking um, digital violence and also through data um, being able to give visibility to digital violence and specifically Um, for women, for vulnerable populations like women and the LGBTQ plus community. Este proyecto eh, es con perspectiva de género. Eh, también contamos con una página web donde se encuentra información sobre la violencia digital. This project is with the gender perspective. And we have a web page where we also speak about uh, digital violence. El, el proyecto nace a través de encuestas realizadas a, a través de redes sociales a los países centroamericanos donde se identificaron 11 tipos de violencia digital que sufren las poblaciones más vulnerables. Um, the project um, was born throughout um, questionnaires that were sent out through social media in Central America, and we were able to identify 11 different types of, um, de uh, of digital violence that the vulnerable populations suffer. El proyecto y la página web cuenta con información sobre la violencia digital, los 11 tipos de violencia digital, eh, recursos guía para reportar ante plataformas y ante las autoridades estatales de cada país. En um, la web page of the project, of the project There is information about digital violence, about the 11 types of digital violence, and there is also uh, resources on how to report these issues on all the different platforms, and also on how to report the issues to the state authorities of all the countries. Eh, también hay recursos de otras organizaciones, recomendaciones de seguridad digital en la misma plataforma. Y como segunda parte del proyecto, se está implementando la asesoría legal inicial para las personas que son víctimas de la violencia digital. Uh, we also have resources from other organizations um, about the digital security in our platform. And then the second part that we're trying to implement is to give, give these people um, legal advice on how to move on after you've been a victim of digital violence. So uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, 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 Silvia. Uh, I would love to hear all of your recommendations. Is there something you would like to just share as a summary to us? Muchísimas gracias, Silvia. Me encantaría escuchar todas sus recomendaciones y quisiera saber si hay algo que nos puedas compartir como un resumen a nosotros. Ok. Eh, voy a compartir el link de la página. También este proyecto busca eh, evidenciar con datos sobre la violencia digital para que los tomadores de decisión, en este caso los legisladores de parlamentos, asambleas o congresos puedan crear eh, políticas públicas y leyes que aborden la violencia digital. Um, yes, I will share the link for the website. Um, but this project, what it does is it tries 
to evidence with the data what is happening with the digital violence so that the decision makers from parliaments, assemblies, congresses can create policies about digital violence. Um, las, las investigaciones en estos casos son bastante importantes porque evidencian eh, los problemas sociales que vivimos y pueden ayudar a las políticas públicas. Um, research in this area is very important because it can help um, put in evidence the social problems that we are living in and experiencing and it can also help uh, with the development of public policy. Thank you so much, Sylvia. You're from Guatemala. That's Thanks. even nicer. I really appreciate it and I couldn't agree with you more. Comments, uh, really due to the lack of time, we just have to move on. Appreciate your uh, real thoughtfulness and great work you're doing in Guatemala. Uh, next, we have Reut Menashe from uh, B-Sides TLV Israel. I just hope I pronounced your name correctly. Thank you. Yeah, I pronounced my name perfectly. The name, my name is Reut Menashe. I'm from Tel Aviv, Israel. Thank you for inviting me to this uh, honorable forum. Thank you, Micha, for inviting me specifically to this uh, a forum. I'm the presenter and the co-founder of two amazing organizations uh, based locally in Israel. The first one is Besides TLV, which is part of a really big global group all around the world, started in uh, uh, Las Vegas as uh, an answer for conferences that are not that are not commercial meaning a lot of hackers going to conferences all around the world and they understand they want to have conferences which are not going to be very commercialized and not uh, and much more into the into networking and much more into the professional stuff so a guy named Jack Daniels founded B-Side Las Vegas. It started 13 years ago in Vegas, and then it's become to be a global epidemic uh, in a good way. And we are the founders of Business Tel Aviv, which is currently the biggest hackers conference in Israel. We have yearly event, uh, uh, which is part of the uh, yearly National Cyber Week uh, in the Tel Aviv University which uh, bring a lot of uh, uh, people from all around the world to hear more about cyber. And besides Tel Aviv, it's for specifically for the more hands-on people. Let's say we have talks, we have workshops, we have variety of opportunities for beginners to start their own journey into the cyber and to learn to be more ethics and more professionals into the cyber. This is besides Tel Aviv. And I surely invite you all to, to join us in our next conference, which is going to be in the uh, 29th of June in Tel Aviv. Um, and this is besides TLV. I would like to also mention Leading Cyber Ladies, which is another organization that uh, I founded with my co-founders, uh, Karen Lazari and Ila Meller. Uh, we started uh, the initiative, Leading Cyber Ladies, started in 2015 by Karen and Ila. They, decided that they need more women in, in cyber. As you know, I think uh, the cyber industry is lacking women, in women. The whole technology industry is lack of, of women, but specifically, I think the cyber is more, uh, the situation is, is more uh, intense with the lackness of uh, women. So we founded this organization in order to empower women. And we, we basically started in Tel Aviv, but we become to be a global organization. So we have chapters in New York, in Toronto, in uh, um, Tokyo and in London. So we also always looking for more chapters, founders all around the world. You need to be women and you need to be uh, in, the, in, in the cyber industry. So we give you the all infrastructure, how to build a chapter and help you to organize your own uh, community friends in your local chapter. And we gather from time to time, we help each other to find the work. Really amazing stuff has been happening because of this uh, gathering, because of leading cyber ladies. 
I'm sure I'm not familiar with all of this, uh, with all of the networking and all of the follow follow up uh, opportunities that become because of the community. But this is the beauty of community and empowerment of women and locally and, and women can see role models that just uh, how they want them, themselves to be. And it's really, it's a great, uh, great initiative. And I'm really proud to be part of both of this organization. Thank you so much. Happy International Women's Day to you and to all the incredible women that have been that have been here. I think fantastic. We also do a lot of uh, pro women initiatives here at Amrita, and totally uh, agree with you on the importance of that. I really hope that we will be able to collaborate uh, on many fronts together. Thank you so much for attending today's event. With that, I'd like to move on to our uh, very Thank important uh, uh, participant here. Uh, Mika Wise, uh, um, you know, uh, with several, several decades of experience. He's a true cybersecurity practitioner um, and works with the Ministry of Finance in Israel. Would love to hear from him. What are his thoughts on policies and policy recommendations? Hi, uh, to all. First of all, uh, thank you for uh, inviting me to talk today. I think it's a very important um, opportunity to open uh, all our ideas to uh, G20 and C20, and it's amazing. Uh, I wish to be the last uh, speaker because I thought it's uh, so much ideas come on, onto the table. So everybody took all my ideas and I'm free, of, free to go. And if I will be the last, maybe everybody will talk about uh, everything. But I, there is a, a, a lot of uh, information and a lot of issues and topics that we can talk about it. And I, I would like to um, give just a, to do it very shortly because the, the uh, previous speaker talked about a lot of uh, topics need to be uh, on the table. And I think uh, most of them have a very, very good and um, um, important uh, recommendation for the G20. If I can just bring my two cents, it's um, there is a three angle that combined from government, law enforcement, and citizen. And in the middle, I can see the, the public trust. If I can see the citizen, and we saw, and a lot of the previous speakers talked about it, but if, if there is a, a lot of digitization and fraud, and uh, citizen lost the trust on the, on the digital uh, services, especially, of course, on the financial ecosystem, but not only. And from the other end, the government and the law enforcement want to help that everyone, everything should be together, but it, there is no um, good way or uh, we, we can improve it if, if we can put it on the table. So my recommendation is to encourage governments to build some kind of ecosystem that will be from one side, citizen can report and share the fraud, the problem, the insights that they got from the digital environment. From the other side, law enforcement got the information and can take handle, like, like Idan from the Isaac told that we try to do it over here. But of course, if everybody will do it, and the connection between the citizen to law enforcement and to um, uh, and governments and everybody will work together to solve it. I think it will uh, empower the citizen. That's the end of the uh, in the end of the day. And I think it's very very important to encourage government to work, government, law enforcement, and private market, of course, to work together and give the citizen feedback. Because if they report for something and nobody come back to them and you know it, they don't know what happened, they will not report again. And again, it's go to the chaos, to the to the universe. But if you gathering the information together and somebody take care about it, it's it's uh, bring back the um, the trust uh, for for the citizen. So this is my two cents on the recommendation because it. All the I agree with all the other recommendations that uh, wasn't available until now, and thank you again for the opportunity to, to talk and uh, to be here. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Very well said. I think uh, you summarize it quite well. We do have one more speaker. I know you wanted to say the best to say it for the last, <laughs> but we do have one more speaker. Um, uh, she is Ms. Uh, uh, Shirin Shibana Khan from People's Vigilance Committee on Human Rights uh, India. Uh, Ms. Khan? Yeah. Yeah. Hello. Due to the net problem, I will, uh, there's a problem with the videos. And the discussion was quite good. And uh, from uh, the India is very young country in the terms of the digital things. So here, uh, our organization is working in the Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand, and the Bihar, which is the northern part of India. Here, we are working with the most marginalized communities. We are trying to create the digital literacy to them because they are not familiar with the terms of the digital things. And due to that, they are the victim of the phishing and the other things. So from the very initial age, from the schooling, we are trying to teach to the uh, children, making the familiar with them with the terms, uh, using the Googles, how to search the things and how to uh, get the good things on the, uh, while searching the things for them. Because the lot of the uh, bad things, if you search, it is it come in the front and the good things, uh, it is very difficult to find sometime. So in that terms, we are trying to make the student familiar. We are trying to uh, work with the youth in terms of creating the digitalization uh, using because nowadays we everybody is uh, having the uh, using the Paytms and the Google Pay and the Phone Pay for making the transactions. So uh, we saw many cases. We entertained many cases due to the phishing. Their account was totally drained. So other hand, we are trying to uh, tease them that. Uh, you, they don't have to uh, click on that type of message because the government is already doing the uh, creating awareness, but uh, at the other hand, it is not sufficient. But here, uh, our organization is doing the unique things uh, in the term of digitalization because we are one hand uh, creating the digital awareness. Second hand, we are using the digital things to eliminate the gap from the most marginalized communities to the decision makers for getting the justice, for providing the resources, which we very successfully uh, did during the time of the COVID. Because everything was locked down and we have only phone, laptops, internet connection for having the connection from one community to another, from one place to another. So that worked a lot and the hats off to the uh, state government, central governments. So when we were uh, the machineries who were work working there, so when we're trying to put a complaint immediately, we, we saw the result. So we are trying to use the digital things uh, like that. And it also helped in scanning the lot of the cases from the across India for filing the complaints. If you look over the uh, annual report, every day crores of rupees compensation is dispersed to the person who we didn't know. It is a cases of the witch hunting. It is a case of child trafficking. It is a cases of the police torture, extrajudicial killing, any things. What we get the information from the newspaper, what the information we get from the other part of our state, because India is very big, a lot of the peoples are living here. So one hand, we are trying to uh, use that, but other the challenges is against regarding the digital security, because we don't have uh, much Thanks for that, because even as a NGOs, even as the organization, because we as a grassroots uh, worker, so if we get the opportunities for having the ca more capacity building from the other organizations who are working in any part of world, that can help to strengthen uh, in providing the service to the most marginalized communities and contributing to the SDGs, because already we have a lot of commitment there and the digital things is, uh, incorporating in, in each and every uh, uh, the goals of the SDG. Because what we in the very limited resources, because if you are sending by post, it is a time taking, but how the digital things in a very minutes, it provide the uh, service to the thing. So this so is Ms. the thing. If I was going to summarize your thoughts, is it more that basically there's a lot of vulnerable people who just don't have the literacy to be able to protect yeah, yeah. themselves and really taking the effort and initiative and regulatory requirements to be able to educate them is the most important thing that you feel 
the, from the yeah. areas that you're coming from, from your exposure. Am I summarizing you correctly? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. So because we are running out of time, I really would love to hear from you personally on any further recommendations you might have as well to this forum. So uh, with that, I would really like to thank everybody here and uh, request my colleague, uh, uh, Gilad Dressel, to just uh, share some uh, final thoughts. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for your uh, for staying with us to this point. I'm just going to share uh, two slides. It'll take less than one minute, I promise. Our next events, just so we're aware, we are currently here. We just finished uh, today's policy discussion. We have two more this week. On March 10th, we have Technology for Empowerment. On March 11th, we have Transparency, Trust, and Disinformation. Uh, we also have uh, two more side events going on simultaneously on March 11th, but I'm not, uh, yes. So then we have our inception in Nagpur, and then uh, a few more webinars will be coming. And the last one we really want to highlight is in May 13th and 14th, there will be a two-day summit, our International Conference on Technology Security and Transparency. This will be in Coimbatore. You are all invited. We would love to see you. Uh, please email us and we will send you a direct post to your invitation. And finally, if you want to know more about what we're doing, you can go to c20.ama.org and look for technology, security, and transparency. There are three things you can do. You can submit your policy thoughts to us for our policy draft. There's a big button that says submit your policy. You can share your case studies, uh, which are, uh, we call them udaharans, and they are your good examples of work that has been done that we will highlight on our website. And you can register with a Civil 20 and with us to get more information. We really, truly appreciate all your time with us tonight. Sorry that we ran over. Uh, thank you very much for being here and for sharing all your extremely valuable insight. Thank you very much. Thank you all again. Really appreciate your time and your inputs. They're extremely significant and important to this endeavor that we, we are taking. We hope to be interacting with you again uh, in the next weeks and months as well. Thank you again.